Um, hello and welcome everybody. You have joined the David Hume Institute to talk tax with Dr. Aaron Advani from Warwick University, Dr. Andrew Summers from LSE and Charlotte Barber from ICAS. And I'm Susan Murray, the director of the David Hume Institute. The David Hume Institute is an independent, non-partisan think tank based in Edinburgh. We've been operating at the heart of public policy debate for over 35 years and we undertake research and analysis to encourage open and honest conversations and increase understanding of public policy. We're funded entirely by donations. We're delighted you've chosen to join us today and spend the next 45 minutes before what is likely to be a very interesting budget from the Chancellor. We've organised today's session to have a bite-sized overview of Aaron and Andy's research and to hear reflections in a Scottish context from Charlotte. As today's session is short, if you have any questions, please use the chat, fu chat function and I collate the questions in the discussion after the presentation. For those of you on Twitter, the hashtag for the event is DHI Bytes Tax. For any questions we do not manage to cover today, the speakers have offered to follow up after the events. So, tax. It can be a controversial subject, subject and debate on tax is often very polarised. An individual's opinion on tax often relates to their worldview and their personal circumstances. And in the coming months and years post COVID-19, the conversation on tax and public finances will never be far from the headlines. Currently, I think it's fair to say we have quite a complicated tax system. Few people outside the world of finance and accounting have an understanding of the complex relationships between the headline rates they hear in the press and the numerous reliefs and incentives which have evolved over time. And so often the discussion in Scotland is only focused on taxes that are devolved. The research undertaken by the teams from LSE and Warwick Universities, led by Aaron and Andy, uses anonymised HMRC data and looks at the complex relationship between the different taxes, reliefs and incentives for people with the same total income. And although in Scotland there are proportionally fewer higher rate taxpayers, the research uses this data analysis to start an open discussion about the tax system. So without further ado, over to Aaron. Uh, great, thanks very much Susan. Uh, so as you heard, we'll be pulling out work today mostly around some uh, recent stuff that Andy and I have been doing on how much tax, what we call how much tax the rich really pay. So to kind of explain why that's even a question, oh, I should say that this is using data from the, the uh, tax authority and so it's not their view. Uh, so to explain sort of why it's even a question how much tax the rich pay, this first bar shows you sort of the picture you would have if you were at least elsewhere in the UK. And we'll come later on, Charlotte will talk a bit more about the uh, kind of specific issues for Scotland because obviously the, the rates are devolved to some of these uh, issues. But first, just looking at the UK as a whole, this shows you the kind of headline rate on earnings. So you could think about someone who's earning a hundred thousand pounds, they have a job and it pays them a hundred thousand pounds. How much tax do they pay? Well, what they pay is, there's a chunk of their income about 12,000 pounds on which they uh, pay no, income tax because the, the personal allowance uh, exempts that. Then they pay the basic rate uh, of 20% for, for some chunk of their income. And then they pay the higher rate for another chunk. And then on top of that, there are uh, national insurance contributions they will have paid uh, from the national insurance contribution threshold all the way up. And so altogether that adds up to almost 35,000 pounds in tax they're paying. And therefore their, their kind of headline average tax rate is about 35%. So that's the kind of amount of money that you might often think of someone who has a hundred thousand pounds as, as having to pay. Now, the thing is there are actually lots of different ways you can receive income and depending on how you receive that income, you would actually pay different rates. So if instead you had money that comes from savings or you own a house that you're renting out or you're getting money from a pension, you don't pay national insurance contributions. That means that the tax rate that you're paying is uh, lower because you kind of lose this green bar that's here. If instead your incomes uh, are from dividends, there's a yet lower rate. I should point out that the work we're doing because it's using tax data was, was based on the data that were available. And so we'll be talking about stuff from 2015 and 2016. Um, since then, the dividend rate has gone up a bit. So this is a bit lower than uh, what, what it would look like now. Uh, and then finally, you could be getting remuneration not in the form of income, but in the form of capital gains. I'll talk a bit more in a moment about capital gains, but that has an even lower rate that you would have access to uh, than uh, uh, income from earnings or other forms of income. And now that dividends have gone up, this rate is even more attractive relative to dividends. There's one other thing I should point out before I move on, um, which is sometimes it's argued that the rate on dividends isn't so low because there's also a corporation tax uh, that people have to pay. And so 
suppose I set up a firm and I'm uh, kind of paying corporation tax on the money that I bring in through my personal service company first, and then I'm taking my pay as dividends, then maybe it's sort of wrong to think about the only tax I'm paying as dividends because I'm also paying corporation tax. I think that's an important point. Here we're focused on the, the kind of statutory rate, what is assigned to the individual rather than sort of the overall economic incidence of, of a tax. But if you were thinking that corporation tax was important, it's also important to notice that up here you'd need to add even more because there's employer national insurance contributions you'd want to add on top of employee national insurance contributions. So that's just some of the technical stuff for people who know this uh, area. So why might we be worried about uh, kind of these different tax rates uh, and what they mean in terms of how much tax the rich are paying. So this is a graph showing you for the top 0.1% of the UK population, that's about 54,000 people, ranking them by capital, taxable capital gains. Uh, how are those taxable capital gains distributed? So on the right hand most bar here, we have the thousand people with the highest amount of capital gains in the country. Uh, then the next thousand and the next thousand going further down up to the top 54,000 people. And these top 54,000 people represent sort of 95% of all taxable capital gains. Now taxable is really important here. We'll be focusing on taxable gains. If you were thinking about capital gains in a kind of bigger picture sense, if you own a home and you sell it later on for a higher price than you bought it for, that is also a capital gain. You own capital and the value of it's increased. But main homes are exempted from capital gains and so they're not included here. So these are taxable gains. And what you can see from this graph is that these gains are incredibly concentrated. 95% I already told you of all, gain, all, all taxable gains go to the top 0.1%. But even among that top 0.1%, the gains, are, the taxable gains are really concentrated at the very top. So that the top 5,000 people, that's the top, uh, the top 5,000 people, these, these five bars, get more than half of all capital gains in the taxable capital gains in the entire country. So that makes us suddenly think, well, okay, if gains are so concentrated, it's going to be important to think about what that means for the, the total average tax rate that people are actually paying because there are people who are receiving millions of pounds in gains and gains as i just showed you are taxed at a much lower rate so this gray line here is showing you as incomes rise going up to many millions of pounds uh, what would be the headline rate so i showed you before uh, on that first graph for somebody earning a hundred thousand pounds the headline rate for them was almost 35 percent it was 34.7 so that's how much uh, the average tax rate would be for them, given the kind of mix of some income at the personal allowance, some income at 20%, some income uh, at 40%, and as you go further up, some at 45%. As I say, these are the UK rates, and I know I'm very aware that the Scottish rates are different, and we'll talk about that later uh, with Charlotte. This shows you how that headline rate would evolve so that you get to this top rate of about 47 pence in every pound, uh, which is the 45p that you would pay uh, on, uh, on income tax plus 2p on national insurance. And so that's what people often think about when they say that, oh, the rich couldn't possibly be asked to pay more tax because they're already paying almost half of their income in tax as it is. But as I showed you, uh, there are these other tax rates that are available. So when people get income, they're not only getting it in the form of earnings, but they're sometimes getting it in the form of investment income or in dividends. When you take into account those things and also take into account various reliefs and deductions that are available, the effective rate that people are actually paying uh, on their incomes is, is kind of substantially lower. So it's around seven points lower uh, for most of the distribution, uh, rising slightly more, uh, what kind of what this gap is. And, and that's kind of important. So if you think about this as, you know, seven percentage points might not sound like a lot, but if you're someone who's earning two million pounds, that gap is worth to you individually is 140,000 pounds of extra money you get to take home instead of paying to the tax man as people currently expect that you are doing. It's also important to stress that this is not about kind of complex avoidance behaviors that people are doing where they're kind of sending some money offshore in some complicated way. To the extent that those things are going on, we're actually underestimating the effect here. But this is really about the incentives that the tax system currently creates by having these different rates of tax, only some of which, from a Scot Scottish perspective, only some of which you are able to vary, um, but only having, having these different rates of tax and also having these various reliefs and deductions. When you take into account beyond this uh, capital gains as well, the effective rates are even lower. So they, they decline much more rapidly. And so you can see it's kind of sharply regressive from about 250,000 pounds of income plus gains. So we call this total remuneration. Um, but when you add in income plus gains, for after about 250,000 pounds of income plus gains, uh, average tax rates are actually falling across the distribution. But they also, I mean, these averages 
which I'm now pulling out as this red line here, which I just showed, is the same as the line I just showed you, actually belie a lot of variation among people who have the same uh, level of income plus gains, the same level of total remuneration. So here what these lines are showing you is, firstly, for the median person, the this, this middle black line is showing you for the median person, uh, what is their average effective tax rate? So what share of their total income plus gains are they paying in tax? Uh, and you can see that's actually fairly well follows the, the mean line uh, kind of towards the right-hand side of the graph. It is somewhat higher uh, for, for people who are earning about, who are receiving less than about two million pounds in total remuneration. But actually there are some people, so uh, up below about two million pounds, about a quarter of people are paying close to that headline rate, what you would expect them to pay if they were just having only income from earnings, they weren't able to claim any reliefs or deductions, they weren't getting any income in other forms or getting capital gains. At the very other extreme, there are about 10% of people uh, who have kind of substantially lower rates. As you get to the to much higher levels of remuneration, almost a quarter of people are paying these rates of close to 10%. Now it's important to note that this kind of close to 10% level comes from uh, use of uh, a particular relief called entrepreneur's relief, which allows you to have uh, capital gains uh, paid at a, a rate of 10%. The, the uh, eligibility for that has now been tightened. You can only receive up to a million pounds uh, at that rate. And so some of that effect will have changed by now, uh, but there are other reliefs that still allow up to 10 million pounds at 10%. And so there, there will likely to be other behaviors that might allow some people to be uh, getting these extremely low rates. But I think the important thing to get from this picture is that where the, the mean kind of line will show you that on average rates are much lower than we think that's actually driven by very different behaviors underlying it and again as i say these behaviors are not uh, kind of people doing necessarily naughty things these are people just making use of uh, the structure of the tax system and the the incentives that are baked into the tax system so to the extent we don't like this this is about calling for uh, changes in the in the structure of the tax system and again, kind of coming back to the point that we'll discuss further about Scotland, Scotland doesn't have access to changing things like capital gains tax rates, and so can't uh, do anything about these behaviours uh, independently. So who benefits? What kinds of people are, are, are benefiting from these, uh, from access to these low rates? This is predominantly investors and owner managers. So these are the people, investors are people whose uh, incomes are largely coming from uh, dividends, and so unsurprisingly they're getting the benefit of the lower dividend tax rate relative to the uh, earned income tax rate. Uh, but they're also the kind of people who have a lot of capital gains. Owner managers are essentially investors, but who actually manage, uh, who are also directors of a closely held company. And so we think of them as slightly different potentially to some investors because they're actually managing that company as well as, rather than being sort of owners just of a lot of shares. Uh, but both of these groups benefit a lot. The other group that benefits kind of relatively more is pensioners and so you can see the pensioners uh, kind of understandably given that they're older and have had more time to accumulate capital uh, are likely to have much larger capital gains than elsewhere in the distribution although they, they tend not to have as much uh, relatively speaking in investment income so i'll just put, pull out uh, on that thread about pensioners a bit more because i, I was asked to talk a bit more about uh, some of the people who have high levels of capital gains and this is available in other work that andy and i've done previously um, again, using data from the, the tax authority. So this first bar, which I've called Stayer, um, is about, it is showing you for people who are in the top 1% of the UK income, income distribution. So it's people who have more than about 130,000 pounds of income. And who are also in the top 1% of total remuneration. So also have, when you take into account capital gains, they're also considered to be in the top 1% of the rich. Uh, this is uh, the age distribution for those people. What you can see is that about 50% uh, of them are below the age of 50, or more than 80% of them are below the age of 60. Looking instead at the joiners bar, the joiners are people who are not in the top 1% when you're only looking at income. But when you add in capital gains, they're now in the top 1%. So they are very, depending on your view of what it means to be rich, they are people who have a lot of uh, resources that come to them, but it's not coming to them only in the form of income, but the combination of income plus gains. When you take into account capital gains, you actually have a much older uh, kind of view of the population. So these joiners to the top 1% when you account for capital gains, uh, almost 80% of them are, uh, are above 50 uh, and more than half of them are above 60. So they're kind of substantially older than you would get if you're only focused on uh, income. 
doing a kind of similar breakdown uh, for sex, because again, I think this is something else that's, that in the Scottish context has been uh, of some interest. And so Susan asked me to kind of talk a bit about this. Um, we see a similar sort of pattern with sex. So as I think no one is sadly surprised about, 80% of people at the top, uh, in the top 1% are male. So it's, it's very unequal uh, who gets high levels of income. When you look at the people who get, who are in the top 1% when you take into account capital gains, but weren't previously in the 1% when you only focused on income, they are relatively more female. Women are still a minority here, so they're only 40%, but they're relatively more uh, prevalent here when you take into account capital gains than they were when you were not taking into account gains. Uh, and so that, I think, reflects a couple of things. So one is, uh, we know that women tend to live longer than men, and so to some extent, this will capture sort of the widows who end up with assets that their husbands, uh, that, that were left from kind of the husband's estate, and so when they're selling these things on, these are the gains that they're getting uh, in that context. Um, the other thing it captures is the when you're receiving, if you own uh, capital and you're receiving dividends, the dividend tax rate uh, does have some progressivity in it. And so there is, for example, a personal allowance that you get of, div of dividend income. Uh, and so what you might want to do if you are a couple is to split assets so that both of you own some assets because you can then make use of both people's dividend allowances and lower rates. What that means is that ultimately then when you go on to sell those assets, women are holding some of the assets as well. So what we can't distinguish here is whether those are assets that women own because they also had high incomes or had higher savings rate and therefore got those assets, or whether those are assets where the husband ended up uh, receiving the assets, uh, kind of purchasing the assets, but in the wife's name so that they can make use of uh, kind of tax efficient splitting of, of these resources. Um, so it's not obvious that this is kind of immediately good news for gender equality. Uh, but it's worth kind of noting that it's there. So what's the kind of cost of these over, overall effectively lower rates that we see? So this gap between the headline tax rate, and what people sort of imagine you'd be paying if you were paying everything at these headline rates, and the effective rate we actually see in practice on income is about eight billion pounds. When you add in uh, the, the kind of gap when you take into account capital gains, there's another 12 billion pounds, so 20 billion pounds in total that's missing if you were to move people. If you're able to move these people, uh, who are paying these lower effective rates on their total remuneration up to that headline rate, there's sort of 20 billion pounds there. Now I think it, it's hard, I don't think that that is sort of what you should take away as a, as a policy rule, I'll come to policy in a moment, because there are a few different things here. One is we probably think some of these reliefs that people have access to are ones we might want to keep in some form, so we, we may not want to completely abolish them. Um, there are other things that you might want to take into account, and certainly if you just try to raise all of those rates, we might see some restructuring of incomes or, or behaviors that would, would make it hard to get all of that 20 billion pounds. But it's worth uh, highlighting this amount of money because it's large and it tells us there's a lot at stake here. So we need to think seriously about what we're doing in policy in this context. Even if the answers aren't easy, it is important to have a serious conversation about these gaps because there's a lot of money actually out there. And particularly in the current environment with corona, coronavirus, uh, it is a thing that uh, I think is, is drawing increasing attention. So our view on a kind of a policy step that, that might be useful to kind of tackle this is to have something like an alternative minimum tax. So the US has a tax like this. And what this would be doing is saying, there's some minimum tax rate below which you cannot fall on average across your income. So what, uh, or income plus capital gains. And what that allows is, you know, if you're worried that there's a widow who has mostly her money from a pension, but she's also getting, a, she's getting some lower rate on the capitals, the capital that she's selling, you don't want to entirely take away the lower capital gains tax for her, for example or if you thought you wanted to keep some particular reliefs, but you, uh, because you can see the kind of value of them, but you don't like that people are stacking those reliefs up to get these very low rates. Uh, this would make sure that there are some, there is some access to individual relief without having to kind of remove all of them, but it limits people's ability to make use of all of them together to get these extraordinarily low rates that I showed you some people were getting, where I showed you that split between the relatively high rates that some people end up paying in practice and the relatively lower rates others are paying. And just kind of to give you a context for what 35% uh, as a rate would, would give you, if it's on income only, it raises about three billion pounds. If you're also to cover capital gains, that's about 11 billion pounds. And that's the equivalent of either two pence on the basic rate. So uh, in the UK context, raising that from 20% uh, to 22%, uh, or raising both the higher and additional rates together from 40 to 45 and 45 to 50. Again, those are the UK numbers. Um, so, Kind of if you're thinking about alternatives and in this context i think we are thinking about trying to raise money uh it, it kind of the chancellor presumably is going to be talking about that in the coming year um this is an is a kind of valuable way of thinking about it 
And I think this comparison to the higher and additional rates is useful because this is a way in which you're getting money to the extent that you care about a progressive tax system. This is a way in which you would be getting money from the rich, but not by raising rates further on the rich who are already paying high levels, but focusing on getting cash from the rich who currently are managing to pay relatively low tax rates. So I think that's why it's quite important to kind of think about this as a policy context. And so with that, I'll hand over uh, to Charlotte to talk a bit more about the Scottish context specifically. Thanks ever so much, Arun. That's a, a really interesting presentation and it, it highlights the distinctions between income and capital, uh, a, a very fundamental kind of divide for a tax practitioner between income tax and capital tax, planning around that. So uh, I do think it's, it sheds the most interesting light. Susan said at the beginning that we have a really complicated tax system and I, and I completely agree with that on a UK basis. And then it starts to get more layered and more complicated when we look at it in a Scottish basis. And I've been asked if I would just kind of give you a few minutes around the Scottish context, uh, looking at how that might interact with the UK system, whether it has any impact on the research that Arun's been doing, uh, and the kind of questions that we might want to consider, should you be taking it on on a policy basis? And if we look at the next slide, let me just mention by way of background for those who aren't embroiled in Scottish taxes all day long. S Scottish taxes is a quite loose term that covers a number of different types of taxes which have very, very different fundamentals in them. Uh, you get taxes that are partially devolved, and I say they're partially devolved because if you look at income tax, we have the, the bands at which tax is, is charged and the rates of tax, they're devolved. The Scottish Parliament can set rates and bands. But the actual underlying tax is still a UK tax. It's based on UK tax law. HMRC collects the tax. The tax base is all set in, in the law. So is the personal allowance. So in actual fact, Scotland only has some of the levers and we need to be careful with that. And it also means that because it's still a UK tax, you have to watch how your Scottish rates interact with UK elements. You also get fully devolved taxes and I know I'm in danger of possibly upsetting some people by saying they're not very important taxes. Uh, they're important on, in terms of politics because they are completely devolved and they sit completely with Scotland to do what they want. You know, they can have those taxes, do something else, have a variant on, on what you have. We have to write our own legislation for them, that kind of thing. But they don't raise huge amounts of money. What is interesting in this context, I think, is that the fully devolved taxes usually have their locus around some aspect of land because it's very difficult to have a fight over the jurisdiction of the tax if it's based on Scottish land. It's, it's in Scotland full stop, so quite difficult to dispute it. VAT, let's leave that aside. It hasn't come in on this study uh, and we'll park that at the moment. And then of course there's the local authority taxes and they too are kind of located around land. So, uh, uh, and, and there's plenty of discussion in Scotland about those. Yeah, sorry, Aaron, moving on. If we come back to income tax, which is really what we're looking at today uh, in relation to capital gains tax and the direct taxes, as we would tend to call them, uh, in Scotland, uh, Scottish tax is Scottish income tax. The pizza probably sums it up. It's a case of who gets which slice uh, and probably every bit as importantly, who sets the rules on how you're going to cut this pizza up. So one needs to be careful around all of these. The other thing to mention here in relation to Arun's study is that Scottish income tax is levied on what we call non-savings, non-dividend income. And I always have to stop and think about this because it, it, it just is not a kind of short snappy explanation of what the tax is charged on. It's charged, Scottish income tax is charged on any income that is not savings, not dividends. So it's on your earned income, it's on your salary, self-employment, property taxes. Whereas UK taxes, UK income tax still applies on savings and dividends. And that would play into this conversation that Arun has been discussing about where you get your income from and what you pay tax on. Uh, and then if we move on, in terms of tax planning, uh, I've been a tax practitioner for some long time and I suppose traditionally if we're looking at how much tax a person might pay, especially if they're owner managers, which we mentioned earlier on, you would look at whether they were paying income tax, self-employed, or if they incorporated they might be paying corporation tax, 
and then they may pay themselves state dividends. And as we saw earlier on, that might reduce the tax bill. The other element of tax planning that you can look at is between income tax and capital gains tax. So it's possible that say, if somebody ran their own business, they could pay the income that it generates out each year, or they might keep it, they might retain all that income in the company because they might reinvest later, they might do whatever. But then if they come to sell the business and there's a lot of cash in it and the business is sold, the selling of a business is a capital transaction and that's when it's liable to capital gains tax. So that's the kind of traditional measures that one would look at in terms of tax planning uh, across that range of UK taxes. Now, if you put the Scottish picture in on top of that, Scottish income tax goes to Scotland, corporation tax goes to Westminster, so does capital gains tax. So you've got that element of politics to factor in to this taxation of wealth and who gets what. And in around all that, as well as what you're paying, you have to remember that the purpose around the devolution of tax is to bring accountability so that there's a direct link between what you pay and who you vote for. That becomes more clouded if you're also trying to plan around your tax and where the different taxes are paid to. Uh, I think in summary, Scottish income tax, it's slightly higher at the upper end, so that may further influence taxpayer behaviour. You know, there's more to avoid, isn't there, uh, at its worst. Uh, uh, but it doesn't actually change the fundamentals of the tax planning. For the Scottish government, they need to be careful about how they look at this because if you put your income tax rates, say, too high, then automatically it helps to encourage people to transfer into taxes that are paid to the exchequer. Now, they may come back through Barnett formula, but it's not so easy to always track that. Let's look at the next slide. Just very briefly, because one of the things that Arun and I were discussing the other day was you need to bring it back to base and remember that there's really not a lot of people in Scotland who pay a lot of income tax. Now, it may be that when the studies are progressed around who pays how many, what, what kind of amount of capital gains tax, that we might find with a higher proportion of people who, who pay capital gains tax. But on the numbers that you see here from an income tax perspective, there are not a lot of people paying tax in Scotland at all, just over half the population. And you've got 17,000 who hit the additional top rate at 46%. So we need to be, we need to factor that in and not have tail wagging dog. Uh, moving on from there, uh, it's most interesting to see Arun's paper around wealth taxes. I cast the Institute of Chartered Accountants. It, its tax board has just recently issued a paper too, because we would like to look at tax reform too, because all of this is hugely complicated. And there's a lot of process that gets very muddled and takes the accountability and the transparency out of it. Uh, and we've made a number of recommendations in the paper that we've put together. And uh, if we move on, I guess the, the, the paper that's most relevant out of that lot is the one in relation to devolving tax powers, because one of the features of devolution in the past few years is that it's been driven largely by uh, Scotland, Wales, political needs. And we believe in ICAST that you need some kind of coordination, something that's logical and consistent. And you would certainly need that if you start to look at a wealth tax or an alternative minimum tax. And if we look at the last slide here, uh, I've put up a few questions that I think might have a Scottish flavour to them vis-a-vis -vis this discussion of how would you charge people more fairly if that's what we're looking at? What would we do with a, a, an alternative minimum tax work in Scotland? I don't know. Uh, I do come back to the possibility that one of the real issues for me is that I think capital gains tax is really it's not a tax in its own right to my way of thinking it's a tax that is actually an anti-avoidance measure it's to stop income tax leakage it was introduced in 1965 and it was brought in because in those days pre-1965 people used to convert income into capital and then they didn't have any tax so cgt to my way of thinking is to to prevent that and if you charge cgt at marginal rates of income tax then it would fulfill its job. And, and, and one of the key questions for me is, is, is why isn't CGT still at marginal rates? But that's my kind of brief 
thoughts on this really interesting paper, uh, which I hope will generate a lot of discussion and, and look into how we tax wealth. Let me hand back to, to the Susan. <clears throat> well, thank, thank you, Erin and um, Charlotte. We've also got um, Andy Summers here as well. Um, is there anything, Andy, that you want to reflect on having listened to, to Charlotte or anything you think has come up? There's one question on um, the minimum rates of tax, but I think Aaron covered that already. Um, yeah, so uh, well, I, I spotted there's, a, there's one question already in the chat about simplifying taxes through introduction of a flat tax. So maybe I can address that in the context of what um, has already been said. So I think what's important to emphasize here is sort of the issues of simplicity and complexity across not only the rate structure but also the tax base so introducing a flat rate of tax kind of on top of our existing income tax so we said okay instead of having progressive bands we're now just going to tax everything under the income tax schedule at a flat rate of 30 percent in my view wouldn't really simplify very much at all because it's not actually the rate structure that's complicated it's the question of what things you tax at these different rates and the interaction between them so um, i think something that would potentially simplify the tax system would be to apply the same set of rates across a wider base so in other words not any longer drawing the distinction between um, taxable income and um, capital gains for example which um, uh, is what was ju just suggested I think on the on the most recent slide that sort of step I think could be a simplification um, to the tax base which in my view is a more um, sort of significant dimension of simplicity than the rate structure itself um, just on the question of kind of why we haven't done that um, I mean there's lots of sort of reasons of political economy why we might not have um, aligned those rates but one of the reasons conventionally given is because if you're taxing the nominal capital gain so in other words just the amount in pounds that an asset has increased in value over a period of time then some of that tax is is then attributable just to the inflationary gain on the asset and to that extent someone's not actually any better off so one suggestion that's um, that's often given and indeed that the UK did used to um, adopt was that to tax at tax capital gains at marginal income tax rates but then give an allowance for inflation and that, and that was actually the policy that was um, implemented by Nigel Lawson when he was Conservative Chancellor in 1988 so not in that sense uh, a huge you know we couldn't really describe that as a hugely radical um, policy in that sense and so you know one option would be to return to that um, sort of approach um, there are other options for um, discounting by the normal rate of return rather than inflation we could talk more about that but as a simple proposition I think you know back to where we were in 1988 would actually not be a bad um, start on this I think, Kim, <clears throat> one, one of the things that's come up in conversation with both of you in preparation for this um, was it's, it's all very well saying let's go back to something we had, but as soon as we talk about any change in the tax system, um, the, the people that are going to be affected uh, make a lot of noise. And I think the, the most memorable incidents I remember of this was... Um, the equalization of um, national insurance contributions in Theresa May's announcement and how quickly that was you turned on mm -hmm. um, and quite how I think um, one of you referred to the, the quiet majority that might look at this data and say it doesn't quite feel right maybe at the moment how do we have a conversation about it without these polarized um, kind of um, incendiary conversations with he who lobbies lobbies hardest gets their their rate or relief or incentive through um how do, how do we get around that yeah, I think 
I can I would jump in on that just because also I've seen this question in the chat about Merleys and I think it sort of fits in quite nicely there. So the Merleys review, for those who don't know, is a sort of big review that sort of 10 years ago set a new structure for how we should think about tax in the UK and I think is, is very sensible. Most tax people would be broadly on board with it. Um, and if anything, the UK over the last 10 years has actually moved away from that as a, as a tax structure that we have. Um, and I think that, that com comes exactly to this political economy point. That ultimately, uh, the difficulty about uh, designing taxes is it's not just about sort of economists like me saying this is what we should do it's about having to deal with firstly lawyers like Andy who will say these are the actual practical things that we can implement uh, and then also as well as that thinking about uh, kind of lobby groups and so on and so in some sense that's partly also the thinking around our idea of an alternative minimum tax I'd, I'd say I completely agree with Charlotte and Andy on uh, an, a sensible reform would be go back to Lawson in 1988 uh, set a rate of return allowance but then set capital gains tax otherwise to the same rate as income tax but in practice, we know that there's going to be very hard lobbying against something like that. And also, even when we, even if you were to do something like that at the headline level, there'll inevitably be some relief and some carve out because these things always show up. And over time, those sort of things slowly erode to the base and create all of these uh, kind of other incentives. And so in a sense, that's where I think Andy and I think of an alternative minimum tax as having a kind of useful backstop in limiting how much any combination of these various forms of erosion can allow uh, collectively uh, the tax base to be reduced. I think that's important because if you try and remove any individual relief, you have people kind of scream, the people who benefit from that one scream and shout and explain why there's probably some good reason for some version of that relief. And the problem is that you may incentivize, you may possibly be incentivizing something effectively using it, but you're also incentivizing a whole load of other behavior that we don't necessarily want to achieve. Whereas this is saying, look, rather than trying to have that discussion relief by relief, I think everyone, it, it's hard for anyone to really argue with the principle that what they want is some, a, a tax system that allows them to be earning, say, many millions of pounds and yet be paying uh, low rates that are kind of equivalent to what someone on 15 or 20,000 pounds is paying. It's hard for someone to argue that that's what they're trying to achieve when they, if they were to lobby against this. And so I think in that sense, the alternative minimum tax has a kind of useful political force, which is that it's harder, I think, for people to say that they don't want something like this and to, to make a case that the public will buy onto in a way that it's easier when they have an individual specific relief where they can try and make a case. One of the things that we've been putting forward from ICAS is that we would like to see more conversation around the common good and uh, perhaps every cloud has a silver lining because maybe the coronavirus panic will help people to think do you know how do you put money into the system as well as taking money out there, there, there needs to be a, a kind of broader conversation uh, and I think now might be a good time to think about the common good we'd like the mood music to change considerably because you know the last manifestos of political parties were full of we won't put your taxes up and I, I would suggest that conversation needs to change because everybody needs to contribute if, if it is you know that's what tax is for the other thing that, that I think is really encouraging is there are various projects afoot to try and encourage broader conversation i know the scottish government are involved in that and the other thing that the scottish government are hosting at the moment is a citizens assembly which has had some really interesting conversations around tax and i think the worrying thing is because our system is so complicated uh, it's very difficult to understand all the fine details of how different bits fit in uh, and yet, you know, clearly we can see the pieces that are unfair and it's how to properly address that so it works. That's, that feels quite optimistic, Charlotte. The question that's been going in my head is, um, will, the, will the momentum from the clap for carers really affect people's public support for paying tax? You know, in blunt terms, are people connecting the fact that if you want an NHS, you have to pay for it? In, and I'm, I'm not sure, um, having seen the discussion on tax recently um, in the, the mainstream media, if people are really understanding, actually, we need a much bigger conversation. So the kind of complex conversation that you had at Citizens Assembly, because I read through the, the transcripts from some of that, it was absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating, the, the kind of debate that was being had among the audience. I, I don't know whether it will be back to business as usual. You have to hope not. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of questions coming thick and fast in now. Um, so um, Francis Cairncross, the evidence from where Scotland um, people will move in the country away from capital gains. So I, Aaron, I've heard you talk about um, people's behaviour and tax before. Um, 
at the extreme ends, there's evidence that people change behavior, but most people don't, unless it's related to health taxes. Is that right? Oh, I'm not sure about the health tax point, but the, uh, I mean, so Andy and I are doing some work actually in the, the data lab, looking more generally at actually how much people move uh, across countries, thinking by countries here, meaning out of the UK as a whole, uh, as a response to taxes. Uh, I think in terms of whether you move from Scotland, I think it's harder to, to work out in the sense that there's a sense in which you can, even when we think about people moving countries, there's a difference between moving countries in a way that fundamentally changes your life and the way in which you move your tax residence in a way that doesn't necessarily have to change what you do very much in practice. And so I think particularly at the top end of these incomes, you might be more worried that there are people who don't have to fundamentally change what they do, but they have a home in Edinburgh and a home in London, and they now have the home in London as their kind of main home, and they slightly change where their bank statements get sent to or something. And through a combination of those sorts of behaviours, don't have to, to kind of miss out on the benefits of walking down the Royal Mile, while at the same time being able to uh, access these lower tax rates. So I think there is a bit more of a worry for Scotland on this issue than uh, than you might than, than I think I'm worried about in terms of the UK compared to the rest of the world, because there's a very natural set of things that, particularly at the top end, it wouldn't surprise me if there are people who had second homes somewhere in the UK, and you could also potentially have a second home somewhere in England that's much cheaper than London, but use that as what you kind of end up describing as your main residence. So I think that's also where uh, kind of questions around enforcement of you know what really defines Scottish residence to make sure that people don't end up doing those kind of behaviours is partly what you'd need to do. But there probably are many people who, who genuinely do spend time both in England and in Scotland, and it may not take very much change in behaviour for them to be able to access the lower English rates, and you might expect to see some of those behaviours. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that you need to be mindful of too is it's not just whether people leave Scotland, but whether you bring people in. Mm -hmm. And I think, am I right in saying, Susan, in some of the studies we've looked at, a large part of it is how, how do you attract people in uh, and obviously that that's an element of it. So, so one of the things the Institute was doing in a thread of work from um, the labour market was looking at migration. So we had a number of events in the autumn um, with uh, Mike Anderson looking at population trends and also with the National Records of Scotland. Mm -hmm. And there is some fascinating data there. So in recent years, um, despite what um, some in the tax field might say about the change in top rate of tax, we've actually had a net influx of people from England for the first time um, in, in hundreds of years. So that's been quite, a, you know, in terms of population and demographics, they're studying that to see what's happening. But places like Mull um, have had, I think Mike said, 40% um, of the population of Mull is now retired English people. Um, now, that might create an interesting question in relation to capital gains, because it might be that they're retiring mm. with asset rich, but income poor. And, and how does that affect um, you know, the services in the local area, for instance? I think the bigger question, because we are rapidly running out of time, is, is what Charlotte was saying is about, um, are people clear what we're paying tax for, you know, in terms of, it's such a complicated system. I think the graphs that you showed at the beginning, Aaron, are, you know, with, with people that are able to restructure their income, um, have dramatically different experiences of the tax system. Um, there is a question there on assets that's come through. Any of the, the questions we haven't covered, um, we will follow up with afterwards. Um, I want to finish on time because I know the Chancellor is in Parliament making his announcement. Um, and I don't want to hold you up any longer. Um, there's another question that's just come in. I'll just read that quickly. Can we participate in the common good discussion? Charlotte, do you want to say anything on that very quickly before I wrap up? I think we need all stakeholders who are involved in tax and, and do something like this discussion is really helpful to, to help pick it up. It needs to go across our papers. I think our politicians need to pick it up. I think there, there's a wide range of stakeholders involved in tax. Uh, and the more we can lift it into the general arena and, and encourage people to discuss tax, the better. Brilliant. I, I'm really aware that Aaron and Andy's research is really in depth. And I've seen you now, I think, do three or four presentations on it. And each time I get a different element of it. So what we will do is share the links to some of the other presentations as well for anyone that wants to follow this up in more detail. The DHI Byte sessions are really much just designed to give you a taster because I'm really aware with webinars that sometimes they can go on too long and 
you can't get the taster that you want and to know whether or not you want to go and read more. Um, so we will um, collate some of that information. We will also collate um, all the questions and answers from this session. Um, we've been overwhelmed by the response to this session, to be honest. We weren't sure how it would go, but actually there is a lot of interest in talking tax. So I think we will discuss with the various different people um, to see what we can do to, to add to the discussion and make sure that we're broadening out from just maybe the narrow base of people that get to talk about it usually. Because, I mean, there's, there's so many um, interesting features of the conversation that we, that we could have gone. And I think particularly linking with the, the population work we've done before is, is really, really interesting. So, um, Dead on the note of one o'clock, I will say thank you very much to everyone for coming. Um, we've enjoyed having you. We hope you've learned something and enjoyed it. And to the many faces um, I haven't seen for a while in person, um, thank you very much. <laughs> Goodbye. Thanks.